Hello, everybody. Uh, we want to welcome you to uh, the final webinar, Fluid Webinar Series event of 2015. Today we're going to be looking forward at uh, some of the predictions we have for what might happen marketing-wise in 2016. So we put together a number of about 10 predictions for you. We will go over each of those individually, and then at the end we'll have a short session for Q&A if everybody wants to follow along. Thank you for being here today. As always, I'm your host, Dustin Cedarholm. With the holidays and everything, we uh, just have me today, so hopefully you don't get too sick of my voice over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. But we will try to go through this fairly quickly, and I will give you as much information about what I think you should be doing to prep to get your marketing strategies in line for the coming year. As always, you can find us on Twitter at the hashtag Fluid Webinar Series. You can find me at my own hashtag at Dustin Cedar Home, or you can contact Fluid at Get Fluid. Let's go ahead and just jump into our very first prediction this year. And my first prediction for 2016 was that more and more companies will be reinventing their brands. This is obviously not something new to anybody, and I'm sure most of you have heard it. However, I'm not certain that everybody has really taken a good look at their brand within the new model that is kind of this digital age. Many brands in, between 2013 and 2015 have done a rebrand, and we'll take a look at a few of the major brands that did that. Um, but I'm thinking most brands need to be refreshing in some way um, or another. It's so much more than just a new logo. Uh, so many times we get phone calls, people saying, I want to rebrand, here's my logo, how many different designs can you give me? And in my opinion, that is such a short-sighted approach to a rebrand. If you're going to do a rebrand correctly, it needs to be a top-down approach from the very highest uh, C-level group really incorporating an entire new vision um, for the company. It needs to start with the tone. How do you guys talk and what kind of training do you provide your employees so that they can understand where the vision of the brand is going, not just uh, what they used to know. It's so hard for us to switch uh, our personalities and in a way that's what a brand is doing when they rebrand. You want to go from what the world perceived you as before to what is the, the new image of you. And you need to wash out everything that you've had in the past and make sure that the new content that you put out, uh, the way that your employees answer the phones and present themselves, the clothes that they wear, the signs on the buildings, everything should be in alignment. And realizing that can be a monumentous task, it doesn't all have to happen at once necessarily, but it should be in the branding strategy. And so you know, what phase that comes in, I'm not exactly sure. That would be uh, something that you guys want to work with your branding company to determine, but it should definitely be a well thought out and organized structured plan that you execute over some time period with the end result being that you have uh, your entire team in alignment and everything is more or less renewed. Here are a few of the brands that have recently done a rebranding. I'm showing this slide because I think it's so interesting how many uh, industries are being touched right now. It doesn't matter if you're consumer-based, if you are um, you know, B to B, B to C, pretty much every group is having to go through the rebrand with the new digital age. Uh, mobile has taken over so much. People are so much more engaged with how many mobile devices and just devices in general that they're consuming information from. The technologies to deliver information have changed so much. Uh, there's just so many different things that are going on at the moment that you really need to pay very close attention to where you sit with um, your own image and tone, and uh, if you haven't done that recently, you may want to update. I, I put PayPal up here as an example. You can see that they've had three rebrands in about 15 years, and it looks like a, 
not exactly every five years, but just about. And some people will say, you know, we just rebranded 10 years ago. That may be too long ago at this point. And so you see here PayPal playing around with their logo a little bit. And I only showed you logos here, but a lot of these companies have gone much further uh, beyond the logo themselves. I mean, if we look at the Dolphins, they've tried to revamp their entire organization from the employees and players that they have to the look and feel to how they present the stadium and market the actual team. So it's an all-encompassing project that you need to do, and it really doesn't matter what industry or what type of business you have. You need to update it for this really rapidly changing world. Second prediction is probably very obvious, but for me as a marketer and with a lot of the clients that we have, this continues to come up as the number one thing we either do or don't have, which sets us off to success or potentially needing to develop content so that we can be successful. Um, I, I'm, this is content marketing which equals digital marketing. I think that is actually highly true because at this point, content marketing, whether it's digital or traditional, is what really controls your digital marketing. Digital marketing is social media advertising, email, blog, uh, everything that is on this. And ultimately, if you boil it down to one thing, all those are actually content. Uh, your website is content. Your email is content. An infographic is content. And then digital is more or less the mediums to which you deliver that content. And so, in my opinion, content marketing is now what digital marketing represents and marketing in general. Um, there's a few key content strategies I think everybody should really employ. Uh, and first and foremost is just having a successful website. Successful website means that it is mobile optimized. It is uh, fast enough that it's not getting... that uh, a company can't necessarily compete with. You can always say how good you are, but when somebody else talks about how good you are, it goes that much further. And that's really what uh, great content marketing will do, is it will be shared and consumed in such a way that it puts your brand at the forefront as a thought leader and um, the one that people are actually responding to. And you will get all kinds of benefit from that that you can't necessarily have by putting up a static web page and just letting it sit there and, and not uh, have any functionality that people enjoy utilizing. Um, so kind of the big takeaway here, in my opinion, is that everybody really should look at their marketing strategy as what is my content marketing strategy for 2016? What of the strategies that I've included here in the bullet points do we want to focus on? Um, one thing that's really important to focus on as well is what can I make that can become all these other pieces? What I mean by that is white papers and case studies are fantastic documents that can be cut up multiple times to become infographics, memes, social posts, reviews and customer testimonials, et cetera, et cetera. And so just by creating one piece of content, you can actually break that out into 20, 25 pieces of content. And so as you do your strategy, oftentimes if you can focus on a few major projects, maybe you do one every quarter, um, but how that can really get you through uh, the next few months and how you can continue to play off of that. The other thing about content marketing is to leave in a space to be agile and to adapt to the current market. Um, you know, trending topics is such a big thing in marketing right now that if you have a static content marketing strategy, then you may not be able to utilize some of the um, trends and energy that goes into different topics that might benefit your business. And so having some type of a buffer or um, some type of agile methodology would be really fantastic so that you can take advantages of the natural things that happen in the world that uh, your company can be a contributor to.
Number three is seeing is believing the art of video. Um, as this graphic will show you, video is going to continue to grow in so many different ways. This is actually a prediction all the way uh, out to 2018 on the consumption of video. But overall, there's just a gigantic video boom. You can do so much with video. Um, if you look at Dollar Shave Club, the way that they've done some of their uh, online advertising, they've come up with really great short videos that are a little bit, uh, you know, maybe scandalous. They're a little bit challenging. Um, they they have just such an approach that it's gone viral, and that uh, viral ability has really reduced the amount of time and money they have to put into other marketing channels. Video, kind of how I talked about case studies and um, uh, white papers, it can be cut up in so many different ways. For example, we'll use this webinar alone to turn this into um, five to ten different individual videos that we will share in different ways. And you can do that with anything that you do. Do you have training sessions where you feel like it's too long and needs to be broken into chapters? You can have one video be the entire thing that somebody who really wants to sit down and take an hour to learn something they can dedicate to. You can break the video into you know, individual sections so that it's easier to consume and it naturally leads one to the next. And then by creating video playlists within uh, say YouTube, your videos will naturally go from one to the next, and so people can kind of consume in their own time. Videos naturally should be kept very, very short. Um, and again, this is all, uh, I, I guess I'm talking more about uh, maybe a, a marketing video where I want to catch your attention, I want to sell you a product. You know, a longer video would be an instructional video where somebody needs to actually sit down and do the entire course. Um, but I think for most of us, we probably use the shorter versions of videos, uh, whether it's a culture thing, a branding thing, or a product-oriented video. There's many ways we can do it, but again, keeping them short and then actually optimizing the back-end data. The rich data that comes with video is fantastic and oftentimes overlooked. A lot of people aren't putting in the alt text or the descriptions to really help the search engines understand what is this video about because search engines cannot watch videos and so there's no inherent content value to it unless you do the legwork to um, transcribe the video and or do the alt text correctly and so when I say do video make sure that it's not I made a video and I posted it there are so many other steps to make it um, consumable um, that I encourage you guys to learn those and understand them and then do that correctly. However, I, I just think video is going to be such a huge, huge uh, event and something every company can do. Everybody with an iPhone, you know, there's something, you know, they're in the double digits of megapixels and whatnot, and so um, most anybody should be able to shoot a quick video. Uh, a free tool just for uh, those of you out there um, looking for it. Um, I currently use, and as I said that, of course, I have um, blanked on what I want to say, but uh, Gene is actually a free tool. Uh, it does both screen capture and videos, and so if you guys are doing a short walkthrough video, that's a free tool to help you get started, and I suggest everybody start playing with that. Uh, quickly jumping into number four here, social media spending goes up, duh. I'm sure nobody... Uh, Sometimes I gave myself some prediction logs here. I'm pretty sure I will get that one correctly in the coming year. But um, social media is going up in almost every sector. I will say that in my sector specifically, social media spending is not necessarily going up, <clears throat> neither for uh, media or telecommunications. There are, is a lot of um, information out there that says people don't, hire marketing companies based on social advertising. Most marketing companies are found through good content marketing and uh, reputation and word of mouth. However, I think it's good for every brand to have a strong social media strategy because the presence is so great and so many people are actually interacting with it at so many stages in the sales cycle that you really want to be on it. The way that it represents who you are and how you are involved in um, 
how you are involved or just up to speed with current trends is, is absolutely critical. A few things that I would mention to you as you look to your own social media strategies are just to consider your resources and goals before choosing which social media to use. When I first came into Fluid, we were on all kinds of different platforms and due to resource constrictions, we decided that it would be better to focus on um, three or four rather than try to do every single one. And that strategy has been highly effective for us and we've seen our individual um, uh, the only, uh, excuse me, I apologize. Uh, we've we've just seen a lot of that going up over and over, <clears throat> um, and so we're really happy that we made that switch with our own social media strategy. For the rest of you guys, I suggest you do the same. Um, consider if you have enough people, because social media takes so much time, in order for you to be successful, you have to use social media. It's very time consuming. However, I've told clients, you know, if you, if you don't feel Facebook is where your audience is at, you can still use Facebook. Just make four, you know, four to eight posts every month and you'll still be relevant. It's a lot where people go to see your culture and to understand if you're the type of company they want to work for. In um, a world of Me Too industries, what sets you apart from the others? And that could be just a really fun Facebook account. Um, whether you're making a sell off of it or not, people are going there to see if you are somebody they want to engage with. And so I encourage you to maintain the major ones and uh, then focus your energies in others. You know, B2B, LinkedIn is a no brainer. Um, more relationships and networking are built there than pretty much anywhere else. A lot of deals are happening on LinkedIn, um, whereas Twitter is kind of a, a media uh, solution. How do you get your thought leadership out to the media and to different groups? Um, Twitter can be great for those things. Uh, Pinterest, Instagram, obviously for retail and a lot of niche communities, uh, Snapchat to reach your younger audiences. And so who are you, what are your goals, and how well can you maintain um, social media channels uh, are what I would define so that I would choose uh, which channels to go after for my business. Here's a quick stat chart, I guess, of uh, social media spending going up. You can see that for most of the major industries, if you sell a product or have a service, for the most part, it is increasing um, as media and telecom actually decrease. Um, and that, that to me actually kind of makes sense. We're going more towards content marketing channels, and for the most part, the other industries, retail, food and beverage, automotive that are shown here, are doing such a good job of defining social media that that's what people want to consume at this point. Um, you don't want to be super salesy on, on social media. It's a relationship-based industry and so or uh, platform, and so I would really uh, encourage you guys to maintain relationship building rather than sales. Um, there's obviously uses for sales in each of these channels, and uh, again, LinkedIn is probably uh, one of the, the best resources for that, and billions of dollars are being done on those. But uh, you develop the relationship before asking for the paycheck. So just be careful how um, how hard you are selling things on those platforms. Uh, number five is just data, 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 and learning how to use it. I expect data to be ever increasingly uh, important in 2016. And data for some time now has really become a popular topic and something that people are um, beginning to understand how to use it, but I'm not certain that they all do. And so my prediction for 2016 is basically just people will be more informed about data and how to leverage it to achieve the goals that they have. Um, quickly here, I'm just showing you uh, first-party data versus third-party data, and the definitions are fairly straightforward. First-party data is just what you own, so that's, you know, visitors interacting with your social accounts, with your website, with your blog, with your email, et cetera. Third-party data is anything that is not your data. This is the experience, experience of the world uh, done in Bradstreet's. And you really want to use these two information channels together. What you have is a bunch of people visiting your website, and you might know their name, phone number, email, uh, and that might be about it. What third party can augment is what is that person's age, gender, social status, um, 
income level, education level, et cetera, et cetera. And by layering third-party data onto first-party data, you can develop a really beautiful uh, persona of who your best customers are and use that data to then go and do look-alike campaigns to find more of those people. Um, but if you're only using the first-party data or you're only using the third-party data, you're really missing part of the conversation. And there are so many great providers out there that integrate with a lot of your, uh, uh, you know, if it's your CRM or your marketing automation, even MailChimp. Um, they're all starting to integrate together so that you can have more of this information. And the more of that you have, the better you will segment and the more often you'll be delivering content to the correct uh, person who actually wants that content, uh, which is another topic we'll talk about a little bit later here. Uh, number six is ad blockers. I'm not sure if any of those of you on this call have uh, been experiencing difficulties with ad blockers, but ad blockers are increasingly going to cause uh, havoc for advertising. I thought these were a few really fun statistics here. Um, ad blockers will cost advertisers almost $22 billion in 2015. That is a lot of lost revenue um, that really there's nothing we can do about it. And in some cases, we may or may not want to be doing anything about it. But uh, nearly 200 million people will like block ads, and that went up 41% year over year, and will probably double again um, in the next year. Ad blockers are an interesting topic just because um, they're, so, they're a little bit controversial on both sides. You know, the marketers say that ad blockers um, should not be allowed because they kind of... Um, ruin the inherent agreement that uh, advertisers and websites have had. Uh, on the flip side, there's just so many bad advertisements and so many advertisements in general that people are inundated. It slows down their uh, experience and basically can be very, very annoying. And so I think the real solution around ad blockers is just to start delivering better content, better ads that engage people. Coming back to, uh, you know, the second topic, but content marketing is the solution to ad blockers. If you are developing content people really want to engage with, they're not going to want to block it, um, but that's getting an entire industry to believe in that and to start doing a little bit better. Uh, as I predicted, I think it will improve in the coming year. However, I think uh, at the same time, the ad blockers are also going to improve. So in a way, we're being forced to uh, drink our best medicine. This was really interesting. I actually came on, uh, was doing research for this project, and um, I just wanted to know what the, you know, wiki, I guess, definition of attribution marketing was. And right there, as I um, pulled up the, the definition of it, I got right in the very top this, dear readers, we'll get right to it. But uh, this little black um, section here is just talking about how Wikipedia is never going to deliver ads, and they would rather you give them a small donation to help maintain um, the revenues that they need or the capital that they need to keep Wikipedia going rather than, um, you know, convert to an ad-based model where they could probably make a ton of revenue. Um, but so there's some altruistic uh, sites out there that are going to hold out, and I expect a lot more of this will uh, occur. But very interesting that I was just doing some random research, and here uh, Wikipedia is saying that how they don't want to get involved in the ad space. But uh, that actually leads us into our number seven, which is attribution. Uh, ought to be considered by pretty much everybody, and I think that in um, 2016, attribution will continue to be a, a bigger focus. Uh, I've really experienced a lot of conversations with attribution in this past year, conversations that we as an agency weren't necessarily having, um, I guess, asked for by the client themselves. We as an agency are always trying to create marketing attribution and prove marketing attribution back to our clients. Uh, but oftentimes they're looking more at impressions and overall work rather than what areas uh, or what marketing channels are working the best. And actually, for the first time last year, this current year, uh, experienced that as a change. 
And so that's a really great thing, actually, and one thing I wish companies would focus more on. Attribution, um, <clears throat> and I'll just show you the marketing attribution, provides a level of understanding of what combination of events in what particular order influence individuals to engage in behavior typically referred to as a conversion. Um, those two words, events and conversions, are very important. Events are something that you can set up in Google Analytics. And as kind of a kickoff point, that's where I would begin in my learning of attribution, is just creating some different events within uh, GA that you can utilize to sign to see how users are maybe navigating through your site or how often they submit a specific form. Um, but that's pretty much the lowest level and easiest level to achieve for attribution and something everybody out there can implement today. Here is an attribution model that I wanted to show, um, just kind of showing why attribution really is so difficult to do. Um, a lot of people focus on single touch point, which is last interaction or first interaction, meaning the marketing channel that somebody first interacted with would get all the credit, or vice versa, the last marketing channel somebody interacted with would get all the credit for the conversion. Inherently, I'm sure you guys can see the errors with that, where you might come to my website, do some research, um, and you came to my website off of a uh, you know, PPC ad or um, some type of a shopping ad, you come to my website, you don't convert, you leave, I deliver you a retargeting ad, and you click on that retargeting ad and then convert. In that situation, should the PPC ad get all the credit or should the retargeting ad get all the credit? The answer is both should get some portion of credit. Being able to do that is much more difficult. And so this, uh, I actually have given you a link to what I thought was a fantastic Adobe blog for digital marketers. Uh, and you can kind of see how difficult and how quickly it can be difficult um, to set up how much percentage each touch point really should get. But if this is of interest, uh, we'll be sending out this presentation. I suggest you guys all read this article and um, start to consider what would be an attribution model for you guys. Again, I think starting simply with events is one of the best places to begin. Number eight is return of the phone call. I think for most of us, uh, we would say the, the phone call has never left, but my prediction here is simply that people will actually return to wanting phone call as a goal. In so many um, cases in the years past, we went from wanting them to call to submitting a form on our website. Mobile really messed with that, with the fact that they have the click to call button and the fact that people who are on mobile want to do different things. They don't necessarily want to consume large amounts of copy. Uh, more often than not, they're looking for a location or some type of information that clicking and calling and getting somebody on the other end of the line can give them that answer and lead them um, to where they need to be so much quicker than if somebody has to navigate a website, which also just leads to much higher conversion rates. Um, in general, conversion rate is extremely high if you can get a phone call. And so companies are realizing, hey, we went to these forms, we weren't responding fast enough, let's just return back to the phone call. And I, I think with the uh, new mobile world that the phone call will become increasingly important and the companies should both be tracking the phone calls that they get and analyzing the phone calls that they get to make sure that the reps are well trained and that their um, you know dial systems are getting people to the right places uh, and again, with a mobile focus on them, is it you know is it your address they're looking for? Um, you know what what is a mobile user trying to do that is different when they're out on the road or engaging than um, the way that they would engage when they're on a desktop? Anyway, over 40 million calls are generated via Google uh, click to call in a single month. Uh, so if you don't think this is an important attribute, that that number is pretty gigantic and your business should uh, have a click to call option as well. Number nine is a new reality, augmented reality. This may be my uh, favorite prediction. 
And this just comes on the heels of Google Cardboard really starting to make an imprint in the market. Uh, the image here is of an augmented reality app for the London for London uh, tourism, and it just allows you to put your phone up uh, against natural landscapes, and it will give you information about those um, places. This is absolutely fantastic, one of the more fun marketing options that are out there. And you can see how if I had a little cafe right there, I would want to make sure that I'm getting listed on that and so people can come uh, click on it and see what I have to offer um, without even maybe being able to see what's under that bridge. Anyway, um, Google Cardboard, 360 degree cameras that are kind of allowing this technology to exist. And then even a little bit further into virtual reality, which are, is coming to a television near you. Um, all of these things are really making the mobile phone more important and they are making uh, the experience with your brand so much uh, more detailed that it's really fun to see and I think that you're going to see a lot of brands start to play around with this technology. I'm not sure that it's ready to completely take off, but I believe in 2016 augmented reality will be something that the majority of people have engaged with. I know I was just recently at the Verizon store and they were handing out Star Wars uh, Google Cardboards um, inside of the store. Right now a Google Cardboard costs about $35. Um, so to get one for free was a lot of fun, and then I brought it here to work, and everybody, um, I mean, everybody probably spent five to ten minutes with it alone, which is just a huge number if you start thinking of how people are engaging with your brand. Not to mention how I've now brought this up in a webinar, and I've shared it with much of my family and friends over the holidays, um, just how cool this stuff is and how interested they are. And so it really leads to word of mouth um, that two marketing channels are achieving today. My last one is uh, taking the rifle approach. Um, and I think this has already been happening for some time, but I really think 2016 is where more companies are going to have defined segment marketing tactics. Um, so here I've defined target marketing, which basically involves breaking your marketing into a specific segment <clears throat> and then target, targeting your efforts towards that segment. My uh, professional uh, experience has been that most businesses should, should have both. Um, with social media, you can have a shotgun approach where you're just kind of putting out content and it's going out to all your friends and followers and just everybody random that you might engage with. While at the same time, you can use social media and you can load in custom audiences and you can start to deliver ads or uh, content directly to those people. C custom audiences with social media are just a fantastic new um, solution for marketers and one that really only came out in 2015. I know that uh, Twitter kind of brought on their custom audiences and even ads in 2015. And so you're seeing so much change in the digital ad world and, and again, even on the social channels where they are starting to understand target marketing and giving you the tools to do that. And so just to walk you through a custom audience within social marketing, let's say you, you have a list of 100 emails that you want to deliver ads to. You can load that custom audience into a social media channel. You can do it with retargeting. There's a, a number of different mediums that you can deliver those ads. But then you can create an advertisement that is specific to those exact 100 and their exact needs and then push those advertisements out directly to them on the different platforms that they have. And so now you're spending money only on people that you care most about and they're getting the message that uh, resonates most with them. And so in the past where we used to just, you know, say I want to attract every salesperson within this industry, um, now we can actually define it, every salesperson with this title. Um, you know, people, a C-level person speaks so much differently than a director or management level person and their problems are much different. And so you want your ads to match uh, the type of person that you're reaching out to. And uh, the, the rifle approach, as we call it, or more target marketing, is um, one of the best ways to do that and one that I expect 2016 to really adopt and have companies um, see a lot of success from. 
That is uh, the end of my um, 10 marketing predictions for 2016. I hope that you enjoy them and that uh, there's a few takeaways that each of you can use. Uh, here's a quick summary page, and you guys will all get this as we send this email out. And so, um, in a nutshell, I think that brands need to assess their relevancy in the new digital age um, with a primary focus on content marketing as a marketing strategy. Um, ad blockers are something that we're going to have to deal with, and so if you're in the retail um, e-commerce spaces, that's definitely something that you want to be aware of and, and learning all the ins and outs of. But coming back to content marketing, if you have great advertisements, people will still consume them, and ads won't, uh, blockers won't block them. Um, the mobile rev revolution has led to the resurgence of the phone call. Um, you need to have a sales team equipped to answer the phone. Uh, especially as we, we move to ever increasingly mobile uh, generations. Um, and then just lastly, there's so much data out there that you really need to begin to use it, layer your data and use it to segment so that uh, you are targeting the exact person that you want to engage with that specific product or service rather than just shotgunning it, uh, ads out to anybody that will accept it and ultimately wasting a lot of revenue dollars. Um, so that is ultimately the end of our webinar. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we will take a brief moment to do a little bit of Q&A. And so if you give me a second, I'm going to aggregate uh, some of the questions that have come through, and we will get to answering them in just one moment. You guys have asked a number of good questions. Uh, we actually have too many questions today for me to get to all at once in the next little bit and uh, trying to be respectful of everybody's time. I'll try to do this in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, but it looks like we have a few here I can go after. Um, the first question, who should be involved in the goal setting process within our company? Um, that is a really good question and so many times that we go into a business, do we end up sitting down with the marketing managers. These are the frontline people, they're the doers, the fulfillment people, um, and so they ultimately are responsible for showing some type of work that they've done throughout the year, and we will sit down with them and we will come up with a strategy and they will ultimately execute that strategy. I can't tell you how many times we've gone down that path to have complete campaigns built just to have somebody in the director, VP, or C-level come over the top and say, well, we might want to do this. And so the question being who should be involved, everybody should be involved from the top down um, who has some type of marketing or sales role. And for that, I mean you should have the highest level C-level sign off and their assistance in developing the plans. I mean, where available, Understanding that you can't always have the C-level and some organizations are so large that uh, they, the C-level wouldn't even necessarily be uh, effective in that, but uh, where, where it's possible and where it's a good fit, that is absolutely ideal. Obviously coming down to VP and director levels, um, as much of that as possible. More importantly when you start on VP director levels is engaging people across multiple groups. And I really think, you know, rather than title and uh, level of employment, it's more important to have specific departments uh, be represented. By that, I mean marketing, sales, and customer service. All the time we hear about marketing and sales, uh, how marketing and sales need to work better together, this, that, and the other. And the one that I just never hear and never see involved is customer service. Customer service are the people directly interacting with your customer at one of the most important times in the process, whether that is trying to make a purchase or post-purchase and they have called to, you know, file a complaint or even register a review, um, positive or negative. But customer service really has their finger on the dial when it comes to what are your customers saying and what does your customer look like. And so to not involve them to me is a huge, um, a huge miss. And so I would encourage people to get at least those three departments sitting down and get as many high level employees within those departments uh, together as you develop a uh, marketing strategy. 
Uh, let's see, Dunk. A second question uh, How can I decide if a goal is too ambitious? <laughs> I think um, a lot of us have probably just come out of our 2016 goal setting meetings and um, almost always they're reach goals. I think saying that a goal is too ambitious can be factual. It can also lead to drive. I don't know that there is a hard and uh, fast rule for how to decide if a goal is too ambitious, but I do think you should reassess goals every quarter and make them a little bit more realistic, whether they were too ambitious or if you kind of, uh, you know, you, you didn't make them ambitious enough. And so I think understanding what the goals are in the beginning is the single most important aspect, and then assessing them as you go is um, is vital as well. And that assessment period is just so important and one so few companies do. Most of us basically have year-end results and um, although sales may be looking at the numbers every month, marketing doesn't necessarily do the same thing all the time where they really should be. They should be, um, you know, realizing is that even a goal that resonates with my client? Um, I may think that I wanted them to do something and they continue um, to show behavior that is com that contradicts what my goal was. Do I need to adapt or ne do I need to create different content so that they can adapt? Um, you know, it's basically just a good question for you guys to think about internally, but more often than not, I would say you need to, uh, to give the consumer the information they're looking for rather than the goal that you think would be most appropriate. Quick third question. Um, how do you stay on top of the latest trends and new technology? That is a really good question, um, and more or less, I think we're fortunate with where we're at that there is so much information available to us. A Google search is probably the most powerful thing, and at this point, um, somewhat substituting for our own brain power, but there's so much information on Google um, that you can get overwhelmed, but at the same time, it's a great place to start. And so my first um, place would say, ask whatever question it is you have to Google. Secondly, I'd follow that up with make sure that your resources are both relevant, credible, and um, timely. And so there's a lot of really good content and statistics out there, but uh, you know, data from 2013 regarding mobile could be vastly different than the actual data of 2015. I mean, those uh, 2013 to 2015 was a huge jump in the number of mobile devices people had, how much they were consuming on mobile, and so if you're running off of an old stat, you might not actually be seeing um, the real picture of how your consumer is engaging with you. And so I just be careful on what content I do consume. There are another number of thought leaders in every industry. Um, that I would tell you to follow. Um, join their newsletters and try to take an hour each day. I try to do it every uh, morning. I start my day out with an hour of uh, understanding um, new things and kind of just letting uh, the internet, exploring the internet and letting it take me where it will um, to learn things that I think are viable. And then I, uh, you know, kind of flag the ones that are most important to me and then do a little bit heavier research where I think they can be implemented for us. But um, the technology is ever changing. Um, an agency, um, not to make a, a selfless uh, plug here, but agencies, that's their job. You know, my job is to sit here and study advertising all day. And so that's where an agency really becomes an advocate for you guys. Whether you want to hire them to do the work or simply as a consultant, agencies should really understand all the technologies that are available to them. Agencies have, um, you know, the vendors are coming to us explaining, hey, this is my new tool, this is what it's used for, this is why you should use it. Whereas if you're, you know, your own business, you have similar vendors, but people who might be trying to make your product faster, um, simplify your uh, supply chain, different things like that. And those are the things you really should focus on. And so as far as staying up to date, my thought would be you should stay up to date on the things most important to your business and then utilize resources around you that are up to date in the areas that they're experts in. Um, I don't think it's any problem 
to uh, you know have multiple outside consultants for a business, and in so many times it can lead to savings and efficiencies that you really can't produce uh, if you're doing all of it in-house. And so obviously I'm going to be an agency advocate, but I do think you can also do it in-house as long as you have people who are dedicated to certain tasks uh, and then just getting those people the right tools um, to go after what they need. Uh, one time for just one more question, I think. And so um, I think the last one is a really good question to end on. And the question is, how often should our marketing team review our goals? I guess I, I already answered that. I think it should be um, at minimum quarterly with some type of a board with the executive team and all of them. I think I need to see that at least quarterly. Um, this question, again, comes down to resources. If you have the resources, I would say you need to be doing it weekly. Um, but a more realistic is probably monthly. Uh, each month you need to look at your goals, see if you have the right ones, and again, compare it to what your visitors are doing to determine if your goals are actually in line with what your consumer is looking to try to do. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the question. I think we touched on that one a little bit before as well. Anyway, um, I want to thank everybody for attending this, our last webinar of 2015. We will pick up again in uh, January with uh, goal setting, which I'm sure a lot of you guys will have already gone through your goals at that point, but uh, it will make a great webinar for you to kind of uh, just baseline check what you've already done and see if you've missed anything and, and make sure you uh, fill any of those gaps before you kick off the year. So we'll see you on the uh, last Tuesday in January. Until then, I'm Dustin Cedarholm, Digital Marketing Strategist for Fluid, and uh, thanks for joining our Fluid webinar series today.